Good evening. Could I ask everybody to come on in? Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Good evening, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz, I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations here at CSIS. Welcome to our beautiful building on this gorgeous warmer night. Um, we're so happy to have everybody here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Internews for putting this on with us, uh, our great partners. I want to thank Anthony Garrett, who's somewhere around here, uh, who's helped plan all this. Uh, Carolyn Powers as well. I want to thank the, I think there's 50 people on the host committee, so I want to thank all of them. So actually, all of you are here on the host committee. That's good. Um, I want to thank everybody on the host committee. and. Uh, I especially want to thank ja Jamie for uh, having us host this wonderful event. You know, you can't turn on the TV these days without seeing Jamie because he's such an important voice in national security and foreign affairs. And um, we like to think that we uh, here at CSIS get that get out there a little bit too. Uh, but I am really fortunate to have Jamie Metzl here tonight. Um, with that, well, without further ado, though, I, I want to introduce somebody who knows Jamie far better than I do and can do a far better introduction. Um, a man who has uh, given a lifetime of public service to this country um, and someone who I respect very, very deeply. Uh, would you please give a big round of applause for Mr. Richard Clark? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're in for a treat tonight. And I, I've been encouraging Jamie not to give us a short presentation tonight. <laughs> Because other people have been suggesting, you know, people don't want to hear you drone on. Yes, you do, right? You do. You do. Because the subject he's going to talk about is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it may be our future. In fact, it probably is our future. And what he's done is taken an issue that is, frankly, very controversial and served it up to us in a delicious way. Uh, he's taken a very controversial and very technical issue, which none of us would buy a book about if it, the book were nonfiction. Maybe Josh would. <laughs> but nobody else here would. But because he has made it a really fun read as a novel, uh, you enjoy yourself while your mind is being expanded and you are learning about the very near future. Uh, it's very hard to do this. Uh, I've tried and failed as a novelist trying to do this. Uh, but using fiction as a way to raise social issues, political issues, ethical issues, uh, is a very, very tough thing to do. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I won't, I won't destroy any of the secrets, but uh, you'll find when you read it, uh, I know you'll enjoy it, you'll find when you read it that he is a master at raising all of these technical and ethical issues without you even knowing that he's doing it. And then when you're done, you think, wow, that could happen, that could happen. I don't know how Jamie finds time to do these um, novels. This is his second, and the secret is there's a third coming. Uh, because every time I look on his Facebook page or call him, he's running a super ultra duper marathon or an iron person something or other. Or he is in Asia meeting with the new leaders of some Asian countries in Mongolia or North Korea. It's very hard to keep up with Jamie. Uh, and I'm told he actually has a job in, in addition to all of that. So without further ado, uh, let's, let's hear from the author. Thank you so much, Dick. Dick has been a friend and a mentor for so many years since I showed up very, very green in Washington and had this incredible opportunity uh, to be Dick's uh, White House Fellow, which for people who aspire 
uh, to be part of the, the Washington system and to learn not just about government, but how to really make things happen in government. There's no better person over so many years who's, who's done that as Dick. So it's, it's really, I mean, then he was my boss and mentor and still mentor and a, a great, great friend and a fantastic novelist. Don't believe a word of, uh, of, uh, of what he said. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here at CSIS. Uh, Andrew uh, was, and the team at CSIS have just been so welcoming. And this building is absolutely incredible. And for how important all of us who are here think that just raising ideas, and we're here because we believe in ideas, we love ideas, to build this monument uh, to ideas in a place where people can come together and debate and engage is really uh, fantastic. I'm also uh, so grateful uh, to the host committee, which is pretty much all of you, and you fell for the old <laughs> host committee trick. <laughs> it's an old one. It's an old Kansas City trick, but I, I'm so uh, grateful, uh, but especially Anthony Garrett, um, because where's Anthony? Oh, there he is. Uh, I thought I was a pushy person, um, but the number of calls that I got from Anthony saying, like, what are you doing? Have you sent another email to the host committee? It, it just, to, it, to get uh, people's mind share here in Washington is a, is a tough task, and Anthony really was the key person in putting all of this together, and I'm so uh, grateful uh, to him and to all of you for, for being here. And there's something about writing a novel. When I, when I talk about uh, writing a novel, as Dick knows, this bad metaphor that I use, it's like you have a wet towel and you're kind of squeezing the towel and this liquid comes out of the towel. And this horrible cliched metaphor, that, that uh, towel is your soul. And you squeeze and you squeeze and you squeeze and this liquid that comes out that congeals into some other kind of consumable substance, that substance is your book. And then your book becomes this physical thing and then other people take it and they consume it in their own way, uh, on their own terms. And there's something that's very nerve-wracking about that. There's something that's very exciting about that. And so what I always say is if you read the book, and I'll be so honored if you do, and if you don't like the book, I really encourage you to engage in quiet, meditative reflection, <laughs> thinking about the book, what could be better, maybe do you have some shortcomings that are preventing you from, from liking the book? You never know. Um, but if you like the book, I encourage you to tell all your friends, recommend it for your, for your book club. You can get little temporary tattoos with the image of the, uh, of the cover, and it can go on your forehead. Or if you have small children, you can just put it all over their, uh, all over their bodies. But, but it really is just such a, a pleasure and, uh, and an honor uh, to be here. Uh, talking about the novel, but more importantly, about the issues that underpin the novel. And after 200,000 years of our evolution as a species, we Homo sapiens, although I'm part Neanderthal, I know from my 23andMe test, but I'm sure you guys are far less Neanderthal than me. Um, but we Homo sapiens are on the verge for the first time in our history of taking active control of our evolutionary process. And that's so fundamental. It's not that we haven't evolved. We've evolved and we've evolved in fits and starts and sometimes it's been faster and sometimes it's been slower. But we are right on the verge of rewriting our genetic code. And you don't need, we don't need any kind of revolutionary inventions. We don't need any major innovations to make this happen. As a matter of fact, we could freeze science today. We could freeze science and say, all we're going to have is incremental improvements in technologies that already exist at roughly the same pace or even slower than the rate of improvement in these areas to date. And if we did that, if we froze science today, it's very likely that the first genetically enhanced human beings will be walking, or should I say crawling, amongst us in about one year, which is the date that the British Parliament votes on mitochondrial transfer, which is supposed to be December, and assuming that it, that it passes, and then somebody getting, a person with mitochondrial disease, uh, getting impregnated and having the mitochondrial transfer process, and then that person will give birth to a person who will technically have DNA from three parents. So we're right on the verge of this radical transformation. 
And we have all seen these stories in the news that have individually caught our attention. Uh, we saw the story from a few weeks ago about Google and Facebook paying for egg freezing. You've all seen the stories about IVF, in vitro fertilization. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a story about the price of IVF has been cut in half because they have a new contraption that rather than incubating the blastocyst, the early stage embryos outside of the, uh, outside of the mother, they, this is a little graphic, but they can now insert it inside of the mother where the, uh, where the conditions are exactly what you would need for, um, for the development of that, uh, that embryo. So IVF is cut in half. We all know about the Human Genome Project, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And every day, our ability to understand what our genes and what the genome is telling us is increasing. And we all know the joke about the infinite number of uh, monkeys at an infinite number of typewriters, but an infinite number of genomes with an improved, because of Moore's law, greater and greater computing power, we're going to know more and more and more about what our genome is, is telling us. And so right now, uh, in the United States and other countries uh, around the world, we are at phase one of this process that will ultimately lead to genetically enhanced human beings. Because right now, we have a process, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD, which just means that in the IVF process, uh, when, let's say, there's, there's 10 eggs which are extracted from the woman, fertilized with the man's sperm, let's say you have 10 that are outside of the mother, you can grow them for, for roughly five days, and then you extract one cell from each of those. And then you can do a full genomic reading of each of those individual cells, and again, you know, each, uh, uh, each genome, each gene has the full uh, blueprint for the whole human. And based on what we know of how to read the genome, we'll be able to say right now, you can do it, you can choose for gender, you can select against Down syndrome and other single cell mutations. But we're very, very close to moving up the scale to understand not just single cell mutations, but multi-gene, uh, uh, multi uh, polygenic mutations that take more and more. As a matter of fact, I was just uh, talking with somebody yesterday who's a scientist in Michigan, one of the leading genetic researchers. And he believes that within two years, um, based on the work that they're already doing, we'll be able to very closely predict somebody's height. And height has maybe a thousand gene markers, but um, that we'll be able to predict somebody's height just by looking at their genome. And because of that, then it's just there, there's a philosophical debate about whether humans are infinitely complex, which you would probably believe if you are a person of faith, or that humans are just very massively complex, which is what I believe. And if we are only very massively complex, and maybe that's a strange use of the word only, um, that means that humans are ultimately a big data set. And a big data set, again, Moore's law, we're gonna have more and more computing power, and as more and more people have their genomes being read, and it will be inevitable that that will be the case because we've all heard about personalized medicine, and so we'll all have our gene digi genes digitized and on file. That means that over time, we're going to be able to compare people's genes with their real life experiences. And if you have one billion, two billion, three billion people, and you compare what their genes say and what their life experience is, whether it's how tall, how intelligent, all these other things, we're going to know a lot. And humans, we're more than our genes. But our genes, and twin studies show this, our genes are a pretty important part of, of, of who we are. So step one of this process is being smarter and smarter about genetic selection uh, in the IVF process uh, and knowing more and more about what we're selecting. Step two will be right now the log jam in IVF is the female eggs. Uh, the average, I don't know if we can say this at CSIS, um, but the average male ejaculate has hundreds of millions of sperm. But eggs in human mammals are, are much more difficult, and they're very difficult and painful to, uh, to extract. Um, but embryonic stem cells already uh, are used in mice that you can take an embryonic stem cell, or it can be an induced embryonic stem cell, so any like, skin cell or any other cell, and then you induce that cell to be a stem cell, that, stem, that cell to be an egg cell, and that cell to be an egg. And now you have 1,000 eggs, or 10,000 eggs, however many eggs, uh, eggs you want. And then again, sperm is dime a dozen, and then let's say, let's pick 1,000. 
you have, I, 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 I was giving a talk and I just, somebody wasn't paying attention and I, I picked on them, so I won't do that, I won't do that uh, here. Um, but I, if I did, I would pick on Zachary. Um, and um, so now you have a thousand blastocysts, early stage embryos, and now you do the full genomic reading of each of those thousand, and then you get a readout, and you know that you know, these 10% have, have markers that indicate extreme intelligence, these X percent uh, are likely to have Down syndrome, and all the things that we can read on the genome, you're going to be able to know uh, about. And right now, there's an initiative in China uh, at a company called BGI Shenzhen, uh, called the Cognitive Genomics Initiative, uh, where they're trying to sequence the smartest people that they can find to try to understand the genetic footprint of very high intelligence. As a matter of fact, the same scientist who I was talking with yesterday told me that he was talking with people in China at this, uh, at this huge company, and they have all illegally downloaded my book and are reading it, which I was very, I was very excited about. Actually, my publisher found out and he wanted to sue them. I said, good, good luck with that one. Um, so, so we're going to be able to do genetic selection at a much larger scale. And you think even with 10 embryos or with 1,000, the range between your lowest IQ uh, blastocyst embryo and your highest IQ blastocyst, again, these are your own natural children, will be really high. And so the Chinese believe that, that, that they can increase IQ through genetic selection by the people who are, are participating by 20 to 30 points per generation. And then the next step beyond that, again, things that are perfectly possible right now will be to do genetic selection, but also to mix and match genes. And I'm giving a talk next Monday at the 92nd Street Y with a Harvard genetics uh, professor, George Church, who's developed a process called CRISPR that allows for just gene editing, that just to take something out and replace it. So we'll be able, um, we'll be able to mix and match our own genes. Uh, we'll be able to bring other genes, whether synthetic genes or genes from the animal kingdom uh, in. And so we are right on the verge of just this radical transformation of how, not only how we reproduce, of what we think it means to be a human being. Uh, we're so used to this somewhat random process of, uh, of birth and of procreation, but one of the reasons why my book was featured in Cosmopolitan magazine uh, not just because of the great sexual positions that I, that I feature in the book, um, <laughs> is that, that I, I met the editor and I said, look, what we're talking about is the end of sex. It's the end of sex as a form, as a tool for procreation among advantaged people. People will do it because for religious reasons, as Joe knows. Uh, people, uh, people will do it um, because they're poor and don't have, and don't have access. But for advantaged people, people will first select their embryos, uh, and secondly, they will genetically enhance uh, their embryos. And then wait, you say, we don't wanna do this, that's not our, our future, and that's a perfectly legitimate view. And we in the United States, we decided to opt out of stem cell research in the Bush administration. So we decided we'd opt out. Our best scientists left, they went to Singapore, they, they, nothing really stopped in the science. So we can opt out. It's a perfectly legitimate choice for us uh, to opt out. But if we do, it's not go other countries will do it. And if all countries stop, it'll happen. My next book has scientists working on, a, on an aircraft carrier in the, in the middle of the high seas. So this science will continue. And the challenge that we have uh, is that the science is advancing exponentially. It's this massive J curve. Our imagination about this science, just understanding what its implications are, is only advancing linearly. And the regulatory framework uh, for thinking how, how do we deal with this is only inching forward glacially. And a little bit is happening on the national level and very little is happening on the international level. So the science will get there uh, before uh, the countries get there, before the law gets there. And when we look at what happened uh, with Ebola, Zachary is an Africa expert, so Ebola is a huge issue in Africa. And for years, a, few, a small number of people have been saying, hey, this is, this is really important. Um, but it took somebody showing up here with Ebola for people to say, holy moly, this is a big deal. And because of that, when that person showed up, we couldn't have the conversation that we needed to have, which was about what's happening in Africa. We had this insane conversation about three people 
with Ebola here in where it's perfectly containable. And that's the, the challenge that we face, is that these issues are so huge and we're not having the conversation now about what we, uh, about how to deal with them and how to think about them. So let me, let me then take a step back and talk a little bit about, about the novel itself. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked for Dick in the National Security Council in the second Clinton administration. And Dick at that time always used to say that if everybody in Washington is focusing on one thing, you can be sure that there's something 10 times more important that they're not focusing on. And for him, he had these two issues that he was banging away at, as you all know, and those two issues were terrorism and cyber. And people, I mean, they didn't say it to his face because they were afraid of him, but people would say, like, this guy's insane. He's going to get us all killed. Why would we go and bomb people in huts in Afghanistan? What can, they, what can they do to us? And you know how the history plays out. And so Dick really is the inspiration for me behind this whole, this whole book. And so after I worked with, uh, with Dick, I was just thinking, well, what are those issues? And the more I thought about it, uh, the more I felt that issues of genetics and the biotech revolution were, were those kinds of, uh, of issues. And I thought about it. I started reading everything I could. And then in a, in a, I'm sure, an arrogant, narcissistic sort of way, I thought, well, maybe I should start writing articles about it. And so I wrote an article. Uh, Don McDonald is here, who works for Congressman Brad Sherman. And in 2008, Congressman Sherman gave me a call and said, I just read your article, and I think it's really important. This is something that people aren't talking about. Would love to do a hearing. Can you come up and be the lead witness? So I did that, um, and after that was contacted by an agent. And the agent said, um, we'd like to do a book, a nonfiction book. And the, I worked with him. I did, a, I did a, a proposal. Oxford University Press accepted it. But the more I started working on that proposal, the more I realized that wasn't the book that I wanted to write. The book that I wanted to write was just the preface of that book, which was an imaginary meeting between an NSC staffer and the president. And the, and the staffer comes in and says, sir, we've just learned that China has a secret genetic enhancement program. And the president says, well, what are the implications of that? Well, if they do it and we don't, 30 years from now, we think we won't be able to compete. Can we stop them? No. Can we match them? Well, it's really difficult. We have these legal and cultural uh, and political. And if you, if you just say that we're going to do that, you'll be thrown out of office in five minutes. Well, that's terrible. What, 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 are they, what can we do? Well, it's like, well, sir. Um, uh, well, uh, we have this secret thing. We're going to uh, perch, set up a front company and purchase a small chain of fertility clinics. And people who come in for fertility treatments in these clinics will be impregnated with their own embryos, but we'll just make some small changes. So their kids will be these incredible geniuses. No one will be worse off, and everyone's going to be, uh, going to be happy. So that was, that was where I where I started. Uh, and that's, that's, so this book, it's set in Kansas City in the year um, 2023, and the main character, who's a, an Armenian-American reporter for the Kansas City Star, who has a PhD in philosophy, and had, had done three postdocs, got disgusted with this abstract life, wants to throw himself into the nitty-gritty of life, um, and he's living his life kind of at 20,000 feet and at sea level, ground level, simultaneously, and kind of tripping over, uh, tripping over himself. But he starts investigating the death of this young woman, and then he starts piecing together this much bigger story. Uh, this, and the bigger uh, story where it's, this woman was not only, uh, she was dead, but she was killed, and she was carrying a genetically enhanced embryo at the time when she was killed, which is a technology that, people, that hasn't been used in humans, at least so far. And so he starts digging, and he can't let go. And the more he digs, the more kind of all hell breaks loose. And he's suspended from his job at the newspaper and increasingly running for his life. And he starts to put together a much bigger story involving US intelligence and Chinese intelligence and a group of evangelical ministers who are uh, supporting a right-wing Republican candidate trying to take the presidency of the, of the United States. And as he's running, trying to learn this story, he learns that there are more women like this who've been impregnated uh, with these genetically enhanced embryos, and they're being hunted down and murdered one at a time. And so he needs to figure out who's killing these women and why, and are there any others like them who may still be alive? And when he does, he comes to realize uh, that the skill sets that he's lived, he's, he's proud of and has used in his life aren't enough, and that there's a part of his humanity that's missing just based on who he is and the way that he's lived his life. And so he has this group of friends, including his ex-girlfriend, 
who he needs to rely on more than anybody he's ever uh, relied to for him to stay alive and to do what he needs to do to try to save um, uh, try to save these other women. And so the book is in many ways a about this technology, uh, but it's also very much a love story because it's about that we all have we're all made up of code, and these codes are critically important part. Uh, a critically important part of, of who we are. But at the end of the day, there's an element of our humanity which is greater than that, that code. And as we, as a species, wrestle with this fundamental transformation of our understanding of ourselves and this ability to change ourselves in ways that would have been unthinkable for all of our, all of our ancestors, we're going to be engaged in this dialogue with each other, with ourselves, about what does it mean to be a human being. And as far as I can tell, the core thing of being a human being is to love, to connect. And so this character, and I hope the readers, aw, aw. Um, this character, and I, and I hope the readers will, will think about this because we are right on the verge of this fundamentally important conversation which we're going to have about what does it mean to be a human being in an age of genetic malleability. And so my, my humble goal uh, for this book is that people will, will read it, uh, will have conversations uh, with each other, and that it will be play one small piece of spurring on a conversation that we need to have sooner rather than later. And I'd rather have it now where we can be a little more relaxed than in the future when the genetically modified people start showing up among us. So with that, thank you so much. We have time for maybe a, a few questions. So thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, Oh. Homeland, yeah. Well, that's something that, we need, that we're going to be debating. I mean, right, there's a debate, I know you referenced Monsanto with the GMO debate. It's a huge debate over who owns what, and if you modify the DNA of a crop, can you own that? And the people who are anti-GMO, and I'm probably more comfortable than a lot with GMO than a lot of the anti-GMO campaigners, that's one of the things that they say. Do we want companies uh, like Monsanto owning pieces of our, uh, of our genetic code? And so we don't have an answer to that but we need to have a process for thinking through those kinds of, uh, of questions. Yeah, Nils. Uh, Jamie, uh, um, playing, playing out the scenario you, you propose, so assuming it does work out as you suggest, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, increasing the problem of income disparity yeah. right now. This would produce another kind of disparity. Yeah. It's, that is such a fundamental and important issue. I think that, that um, certainly genetic selection um, will be spread because governments and insurance companies will have an enormous incentive for everybody to do it because the cost of genome sequencing will, in very short order, move towards zero. And so when governments and insurance companies do the cost-benefit analysis of how much does it cost to sequence pre-implantation uh, genes, pre-implantation embryos, and how much does it cost to care for somebody for the entirety of their life who has some kind of genetic disorder, there'll be a big push. But there will be a fundamental, unless we really not only have the conversation, but think about this, uh, this issue, uh, the H.G. Wells type scenarios of our species dividing is very, very real. I mean, if these, these Chinese numbers are right, you know, 20 IQ points per generation is really a lot. I mean, we have the limitations of just how smart a human can be, um, I think, but who knows? And so the equity issues are really, really important. Yeah? We're not that far behind. Uh, the question is, and, and this book, it deals a lot with U.S. China, uh, and the, the issue is, um, different societies will organize themselves in different ways and have different restrictions. And we, for sure, have and will have more restrictions than the Chinese. So, like, for example, when I was talking uh, with this genetics uh, researcher yesterday, uh, in China, for us to get a million people, and we have this in, in our veterans, so every time when you join the armed forces, um, you take an IQ test. So we have people who've all taken IQ tests, 
and there's a thing called the Million um, Veterans Program where they're trying to get a million veterans to agree, uh, one, to have their genes sequenced, and two, to have their medical records open for researchers. So it, it, we may get there, and then, like I said before, the bigger the data set, the more information we're going to uh, have. But in China, if China decides that we want to get 10 million people and, be, and to have them sequenced and track them over the course of their lives, which they haven't done yet, but I think it's, it's inevitable that they're going to do this. When I started writing this book four years ago, there weren't all these stories that have now come out in Wired and The New Yorker about what the Chinese are doing. It, just, it was a, a thought experiment that I was making, but it seems like the kind of thing uh, that they would do. So the United States is, is, is there, and some states have less regulations than, uh, than others, um, but the applications issues are going to be very, very sticky, and if we start having controversies around them, there's going to be a lot of, of pullback, certainly in, in societies like ours, who at some deep level believe that there's some divine power that has ordered the universe, versus China, which thinks of a lot of issues as engineering problems, and whether that's the one-child policy or Three Gorges Dam or anything, they're much more comfortable with societal engineering than, than, uh, than we are. We have time for, for maybe one more. Oh, all right, two more, because we're gonna do one in that. And one other thing that, um, uh, so when you guys, I hope, will all read the book, you're going to notice um, that there's a very important character. The lead character is Dick Ranazadi in The Reporter, but the second most important uh, character is uh, the police inspector named Maurice Henderson. Where's Maurice? So there's a real Maurice Henderson. <laughs> and the real uh, Maurice Henderson is one of my, my great friends. And when I first started writing the novel, I just put in placeholders. I didn't want to think about what everybody's name would be, and I thought, well, I'll just change it. And then I just, I, had, I have such warm feelings towards Maurice that I finished the first draft of the novel and that, it's not that it's exactly the same as Maurice, but I thought, God, it's Maurice. I can't take Maurice's name. Who would I be? So anyway, there's the real Maurice uh, Henderson, who's not, the who's not the same as the imaginary uh, Maurice Henderson, but they do have, uh, have the same name. And I, I had to call Maurice and ask for his uh, permission to, to steal his name ex post. All right, so two more. Thank you. Wonderful. So I guess I wanted to ask just a couple process questions yeah. of you. And one is, did you read other you know, novels in this space, like Margaret Atwood and other people who've written about some of this stuff? And then second, um, how did you do it with the yeah. job and running yeah, yeah. and whatnot? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, two things. In terms of the reading, I read some, but I read much more of the science stuff than I did of the, the other fiction. Because like, when I read fiction, I like, like Japanese stuff and kind of weird esoteric stuff, but I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, to, to say that. Um, in terms of process, as my, my girlfriend Malika knows, I'm unfortunately, and I would trade a million novels if somebody can cure me, uh, an insomniac, and when you wake up at like three o'clock in the morning, you're pissed off for the first 15 minutes, or you try to go to bed for the first 15 minutes, then you're pissed off for about 10 minutes, and then you say, ah, screw it, I may as well write a novel or do, <laughs> do whatever. Um, but, I, I, yeah, but I certainly believe, and I will say this, that every single person in this room has a great novel in them, and the only thing that you need to do is as Rocky and I have talked about for a long, long time, is sit your, I'll use the Latin term, sit your tuchus down in the chair and start writing and then edit and edit and edit and edit and until you're there. And like my first book, I mean, Rocky has been an essential partner in, in two books now. Um, the first book took seven years from start to finish. This one took four. I've written a first draft of the sequel. I'm hoping that, that will be faster, but there are impediments out there in the world that I, uh, that I haven't yet internalized. Time. Morning, night. When, once I get into the rhythm, then I kind of can't stop. Done. Have you uh, been able to draw a line between permissible uh, therapy yeah. and enhancement? Um, that yeah. Yeah, that used to, I mean, for sure, when we were talking about, when you and I, Don, were talking about that uh, six years ago, that was the line that everybody said. Therapeutic gen genetic manipulation, so like addressing tumors, then that's okay. And germline, heritable ma manipulation, where you're doing something that passes down generation to generation, that's not okay. But right now, I mentioned this vote that's happening in a month in the UK, that is germline heritable. And there's, there are strong cases to do it. I um, probably 
support doing it. I do support doing it. Um, but that already, we've already are about to cross the germline. And so these issues where we, the, the neat divides that we've made in the past are no longer neat. And so th that's why one of the things that I've been talking about with you, Don, um, is to have a structured national and even global dialogue where there's a congressional commission, or, and the only mission that they have is to frame a series of the most important questions, provide some background materials, and then reach out to universities and civil society organizations and others around the country so that we can have an informed conversation and then feed what comes from those conversations back to this, uh, to this body. But these issues are so difficult and so, and so fundamental. So I think with that, I know there's other people who want to have questions, but there's other people um, who want to have wine, maybe more than the people who've already had questions. So I'm going to be, I think, just outside at this table. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts, sign your books, or, or whatever. But thank you all. So It means so much to me to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.